got your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. As you're turning there, I'm going to take these few moments while you're finding that scripture. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a little story. There was a time, I don't know when this movie came out, but I watched a movie called 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, it's in the New Testament. Remember, I was watching this movie, and it's called Failure to Launch. Failure to Launch. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. It's a chick flick. I don't recommend anybody see it for as far as guys go. It's, it's boring. The only thing that's cool about it is I remember the guy had a Porsche. And I don't know how he had a Porsche because he was a loser living with his mama. And, uh, and he, I think he was like 40. Somewhere about there, and he was, there was no way he could afford that force because he didn't have a car unless he was mo mo mooching, mooching off his mama. Say that fast. Mooching off his mama, mooching off his mama. Can you say anybody say that five times fast? Mooching off his mama, mooching off his mama, mooching off his mama, mooching off his mama, mooching off his mama. That's a, that's a tongue, tongue exercise. So this guy was mooching off his mama, and uh, anyway, he, he was living in this house, and um, the guy could not hold a job, the guy could not move on in life, the guy had a failure to launch, and the biggest reason that he had this failure to launch is because he was simply lazy, he was simply lazy, and so um, as we're looking at this scripture, I kind of want to go into that today about this failure to launch sometimes in our lives, and, um, and it's a failure to la launch our uh, spiritual life, our spiritual future. And so if you're there, say, I'm there. 1 Corinthians 9 and the verse is 24. 1 Corinthians 9 is 20, 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race, all runners run? It's like, um, it, it's a given, right? Like in a race, runners run. <laughs> oh, really, Paul, you're so... Bright guy. So he goes, don't you know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Verse 25, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it, in, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And this is where Paul transitions his story into, uh, into something spiritual. So from this point forward, we're, we're talking about spiritual things. So he goes, on this earth, people, when they go to work, on this earth, people, when they're uh, looking for a spouse, on this earth, when people are um, looking to achieve something here, looking to achieve a degree, what Paul is saying, that these things don't last. Yeah, we're all in the race, and today we've nicknamed it the rat race, where we're just in pursuit of things on this earth. But Paul says there's something greater, because even though we can run this race on earth, for the earthly things, he's saying these things pass away. Are we here? Somebody say amen. amen. A little louder. Amen. Yeah. So, uh, feeling better. So, I'm feeling better. Uh, I like to speak with you. I like to communicate a little bit. So, he goes, but we're, we're, we're competing for something much greater, something that is eternal or last forever. In other words, he's saying five years down the road, you're not even going to care about what you did. Ten years down the road, you're going to forget about what you did today. A hundred years down the road, you're going to be dead. And in heaven, maybe. Some of y'all might be like 115, 120. I don't know, maybe. I don't know how, how late you're going to live. But God's saying that, God's saying that, you know, 1,000, 2,000 years down the road, everything that you did here, that was for earthly gain, it's going to mean nothing. I was even thinking about it today. I was like, man, you know, if you made good money today, you wouldn't even be able to tell your kids like, oh, I was making good money because there's going to be inflation, and there's always inflation, right? There's always rising inflation. So 30 years down the road or whatever, when you're like trying to tell them your story and how much money you made, they're going to be like, dad, were you broke? Because that sounds like nothing. Like we're making, my salary is $4.8 million, and you're like, really, dog, really? $4.8 Not mine. <laughs> Rise got I wish. No, I'm not, I don't know what it was. Anyway, so, but uh, maybe if you write a good book, you write, you make, if you're, uh, if you're, who's that one guy? He gets, he gets a $7 million advance before he writes a book. Osteen. Yeah, Osteen. Anyway, he gets Vasily's favorite preacher. Anyway, so <laughs> go ask Vasily about him after the service. You're welcome to. He's his favorite preacher. He'll tell you all the YouTube channels you can find him on. So, um, but what he's saying is, is that as much as it's going to be irrelevant here on earth, 
you're fighting so hard for it. And, and he's saying, but we're fighting for something so much greater because we have this eternal calling. He goes, verse 26, therefore, say, therefore, I, say, I, do not run like somebody running aimlessly. Don't repeat me. Do not run like somebody running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. How dumb is that? How dumb is it if a boxer gets in a ring and he's, and he's, and he's airboxing, right? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. So there's no point in that. He's just wasting his energy. He's about to get knocked out. And he's saying, I'm not running like one that's running aimlessly. That sounds so dumb. Like, where are you running to? I don't know. Run, Forrest. Where are you going? I don't know. Why are you running? I don't know. If that's you, then someday you're going to stop. And people are going to say, why'd you stop? I don't know. So what, what he's saying here is, is pick a direction to run in. If you're going to do a run, if you're going to run after God, pick your direction and say, on this earth, I'm running after God. I am in hot pursuit of the gospel. I am in pursuit of Jesus Christ. And don't run aimlessly. Don't just pick something on this earth to run after. Because I guarantee you, if you're any good at anything, and if you're not lazy, you'll achieve your dreams. Yep, you're going to make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yep, you're going to get your fancy car. Yep, you're going to get your fancy house. Yep, you're going to find your spouse. If you're any good at not being lazy, if you're not lazy, you will absolutely achieve your dreams on this earth. That's a, that's a given. That's, that's a no-brainer. You will achieve these things. It's, it's not, um, I know it may sound exciting, like, hey, I'm going to achieve these things. And, uh, you know, may God bless you and may you achieve them. But you should achieve them. Because the people that don't achieve them are usually people that are just really lazy, right? They have a failure to launch. So, but, he, but we're running after something greater, and he's saying don't run aimlessly. Pick something that you're running after. Pick a goal, and let your goal be Jesus. Do not, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No! I, you know, they put in these things afterwards, so I put an exclamation point there. It has a comma in my Bible. An exclamation point would be better. I think I put an excla exclamation point after everything. When I read yet? No, no, yeah. No, I strike a blow to my body, and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. What an interesting, what an interesting statement. The greatest enemy you have after you are saved, is yourself. What a, what a crazy thing for Paul to say. Look, before you are saved, you have an enemy. His name is the devil. After you are saved, the Bible says that you have victory over the enemy, that he is beneath your feet. If you ever want to speak to the devil, you write a message right here and you say, get lost, and you just walk around all day long, just get lost on the bottom of your foot. People are like, why you got to get lost on your foot? Speaking to the devil. He's under my feet. Right? He's under my feet. The devil's under my feet, and that's what the Bible says. So I'm going to write a message under my feet, and I'm going to, I ain't even going to attach it to my feet, just to the bottom of my shoes. Get lost. Everywhere I go is holy ground. The biggest battle you have to fight on this earth after you are saved is complacency. And so Paul says, I beat my body, and I make it my slave. Because here's what happens, here's what I see, and it frustrates me so much, and it makes me so sad. Is when people are running the race, and then they stop. And you ask them, why you stop? I don't know. Well, weren't you pursuing something? I don't know. If you're a Christian, you can't just pursue my vision. If you're a Christian, you need to have your own vision about what God is going to do in your life. The Bible says it very clearly. Without vision, my people grow faint. Without vision, people lose direction. That's a proverb. Look it up. It's in Proverbs. Without vision, people, uh, people lose direction. You must have a vision for your life. That is greater than anybody else's around you. It's, it's your vision for what you're going to do for God. And then you pursue that with all your mind, heart, soul. 
and strength. Turn with me to another scripture. Actually, you don't got to turn there. I'm going to read through them real quick. It's Proverbs 13, 4. It says, lazy people want much, but get little. Those who work hard will prosper. I'm going to read it again. I think it's very self-explanatory. Lazy people want much, but get little. Those who work hard will prosper. Very simple. You want to do great things for God? You're saying, oh, I want to. I want to pursue Christ. Oh, yeah, I want to be a great speaker for God. I want to be able to pray for people and see them healed. I want to be able to tell people about Jesus on the street. And I'm just, I I want to do these great things, but but you're not doing anything about that. There's another scripture. I I couldn't find it today, but there's another scripture. It says that uh, one hand uh, hand of of, uh, folly or one hand of, uh, basically one hand of vision and another hand of hard work. With one hand, we can hold on to our vision, but with the other hand, we need to be hard at work. We need to be doing something. We need to start somewhere. We need to build something. You can't, you can't, you can't stand on a 10-foot ladder if you didn't take the first eight steps or the first nine steps. Proverbs 21.5 says, good planning and hard work will lead to prosperity. But hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. I want to tell you a little bit about my vision. When I came to this church, I think it was about seven years ago, um, I came to this church and, um, sorry, it's warm. I'm talking too much. I get to talk. So seven years when I came to this church, um, we sat down with the pastors, Vasily and I, and and they said, hey, we're going to start a youth ministry. And we're like, cool, <laughs> enjoy starting your youth ministry. And they're like, no, we want you guys to help with that youth ministry. And I remember it was just uh, me, Vasily, and Vess, I believe, at the beginning of this thing. And then um, we're like, okay, whatever. And I was like, I will never, ever be the, the youth leader here. And I remember I made that proclamation that day. I, was like, I will never, ever do it. You know, you can't lure me into doing something like that. But lo and behold. Anyway, so... Um, I remember we sat down, and then at the beginning, there was a few of us, and uh, yeah, Marta was there. I think Christina was there. There was a, there was a few people there, and so um, Yuliana, she ain't here today, but she was there. And so at the beginning of this thing, we had this, we had this vision that was placed for us that uh, one day, one day down the road, we would leave the room with all the silver stars and the blue walls. It was really weird. They made, um, in this church that we used to rent, they made uh, tin foil um, like constellations and stars and all kinds of goofy stuff. So anyway, uh, they said one day we'll leave this place that could hold about, I don't know, five or six people and that uh, we'll go somewhere else. We're, we're going to grow and we're going to be, uh, we're going to be a movement. And I thought, well, that's, um, that's quite the statement. There's nobody here. There's just a few of us here. And um, I led the worship back in those days and, and uh, you know, that was, that was an issue all in itself. But, uh, <laughs> like, I, I feel bad for the worship team sometimes. When I'm singing up front, my voice cracks. I go up and down registers, and I'm like, I bet I'm going to throw them off. So I sing louder. Anyway, I, I sing really loud, but it's just not on key. And then I make up my own words half the time. I don't know. I, I keep my eyes closed, so usually my words are made up. I sing what I want to sing. <laughs> I used to lead the worship. I was like, Yeah. And I remember the songs we sing, when the deer panteth for the water, so my soul, my own key. My vision, my vision as, as we stayed in ministry, as we continue to serve God, I remember my vision began to change and I began to fall in love with the people that I was serving. And my vision began to change for something greater. I wanted to start seeing God do great things. And I remember I would have these dreams. I would, I would, I would love, I would, I would love the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody and see them saved outside the church. You see, because it's so easy to come in here where in, in a place where people made the decision to show up and then to preach to them. Because you already made that decision to come here. So I'm 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 very happy to speak to you because you are listening. But it's different when you're on the street and you need to lead somebody to the Lord. 
It's different when you don't know the people. It's different when the situation isn't perfect. It's different. And I remember that was one of my greatest dreams of my life. And I thought the day that I lead somebody to the Lord is complete. It is finished in my mind. And I remember when I led somebody to the Lord and I couldn't believe it. I, God, how did this happen? How did this person get saved? I told him about Jesus. This thing works. It's real. And I remember when I started having these things happen in my life, and I was like, man, I, you can really preach the gospel to somebody, and then they're saved. And I remember my vision began to expand, and I remember my vision began to grow for this youth ministry. And at some point, they made me a youth pastor here, but my vision began to change, and, and so should it be in your lives. You should have a vision for what you will do for God. I think too often people are waiting around and waiting for one of the leaders here or myself to come and approach you and say, hey, what are you going to do? Hey, this is what you should do. Oh, we will do that. And if I haven't approached you, don't worry, your day is coming. So you will be approached about doing something here. But it should be different. You should be the one that wants to do something great for God. It should be your desire and your vision. You know what I love? I love when this royal reader started. It, it was born out of somebody else's vision. That ain't my vision, but it's a part of the greater vision that we have. It's somebody else's passion, but that's how the church works. It is a body of believers coming together with our differences, and we're all pursuing one God. I remember when we started doing small groups or impact groups, it was something that was on my heart. I said, I came to the leader at that time, which is my brother, and I said, hey, what I really want to do is, is these groups, is these cell groups. And I remember he looked at me, he said, are you sure? Because you see, back then, Slavic churches weren't doing stuff like that. And it was kind of weird. It was like, you're going to meet with people outside the church and you're going to spend time with them, and you're committed to this. You know that once you take this on, you can't leave it. You can't drop it. You can't just stop running for whatever point because you're going to drop people. I said, no, this is what I really want to do. This is, this is my vision. And from that point, we started doing cell groups, and one of the people that I was leading in my cell group took over my cell group eventually. And then we launched a bunch of other cell groups, and now that's what we have in the church is we have these impact groups cell groups, impact groups, because they call them cell groups because, right, cells connect, we're part of one body. Anyway, so, but they're, they're impact groups, that's what we call them here, is because they're going to impact our lives, right? So, but it was born out of a vision, and then we can see the legacy of that vision today. GTS that we're doing, I remember Pastor Chuck Schumacher came, and him and I were hanging out, and I said, man, Chuck, it'd be so cool if we did a conference together. He said, a conference? It was our first year as a youth ministry. It was a crazy thing. It was a crazy thing to think of doing. It was a crazy thing to do. And I thought we'd get shut down and shot down. But there was a greater vision. There was a greater purpose behind this thing. And I remember we, we took it to the pastors, and they're like, okay. I said, yeah, Pastor Chuck, he will come out. He will help us achieve this vision. We will, we will accomplish this thing, and we already have a speaker. And uh, I remember it was the coolest thing because we had that, like, Hawaiian Worship team, who remembers? That was so, what were they called? Eddie Hunt and New Era. Eddie Hunt and New Era. Man, these guys, they were cool. They were these Hawaiian people. And I remember the worship. I just didn't want it to stop. I remember I was like, this worship was going, going, going. I was like, what is happening? And then all of a sudden, we had this vision for our worship team. I'm like, someday our worship team is going to be like that. That when they're worshiping, we're not going to want to stop. And today... I found myself in that place again, and it reminded me of the vision and of the dream that we had a long time ago for our church. I found myself in the place, and I thought, God, if I die, can I die worshiping? If I, if I don't get to take another step in my life, can I stay right here in this moment, in this song? It's the greatest thing that's come to pass in our ministry, but you have to have a vision. You have to be in hot pursuit of Jesus Christ in your life. If you're running aimlessly, if, you're, if, you're, if your ambitions are just for the things on this earth, I, I'm sad to tell you this, but there you will achieve them. 
and they're going to disappoint you. They will disappoint you. I promise you they're going to disappoint you. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend, outside of Christ, I, I guarantee you're going to be restless with them. They're going to give you a headache. They're going to break your heart. They're going to play games. You know why? Because it's outside of God. Anything outside of God is already broken. Anything outside of God, of God is already destined for failure. Because the devil does not reward. The devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. If you have a job that you're so in hot pursuit after, you'll get it. And then you'll sell everything else to keep your job. I work in the sales industry, and I know people that make five and six and $700,000, but they lost their families because they sacrificed everything for their job, working 14, 16, 18 hours, foregoing everything, foregoing their children, foregoing everything. Because jobs and, and careers outside of God, they're useless. They're going to fail. Your degrees, they're going to fail. Anything outside of God is just running aimlessly. As we, as we continued on in ministry, I remember I started, it, it was something that I was so afraid of. It was something I was truly afraid of because when you start asking for certain things from God, if they don't happen, you start wondering what, you, you know, if, what the problem is. Is the problem with me? Is the problem with God? Is the problem with that book? The word of God? What is the problem? And I remember when I started wanting and I started praying to God and I said, God, I, I want to see people healed. It's in your book. It's in the word of God. The Bible says that there are gifts of healing. The Bible says that people will be healed, that if you're a Christian and you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, that these signs will pursue you, that you will cast out demons in my name, that you will lay your hands on the sick, that they will be healed, that you will pray for people and that they will be healed, or preach and they will be saved and baptized. So I've seen people saved. I've seen people baptized. I prayed for people, I began to lead people, and now I wanted to see people healed. And it's weird at first when you start praying for people. It's kind of like, I, I didn't even know what I was doing. I remember when I just started praying for people, I was like, why am I praying for people? I don't know what's going to happen. This is the weirdest thing. And then, But over time, as you continue to pray for people, you begin to grow faith. You begin to have this faith and, and just... I know just recently, and I think I told you guys this before, there was a guy whose face was paralyzed, and um, we prayed for him, and a week later, he was healed. Just the other day, I was praying for somebody. Poor gal, she was so shocked. She was so weirded out. I pray for him anyway. I'm like, hey, can I pray for you? She's like, um, I'm like, I'm just going to pray for you, so you better start um and, uh, stop umming over here. You know, Christian people, you know, uh, pray for me. I don't know. Is it going to work? I'm like, I don't know if it's going to work. That's not my job. My job is to pray. I'm to do what God tells me to do. God is the healer, not me. So I'm like, look, I'm going to pray for you. And I remember I'm praying for her, and she, she was having chest pains, and she has these chest pains often, often, apparently, or she's been having them. She had them often. And I remember I'm praying for her, and then um, we leave these people's house. They have some babies. They have some babies. But uh, we left these people's house. And I don't know if she has chest pains because of all her babies. But anyway... <laughs> We left these people's house, and uh, as I'm driving home, she's like, hey, you know what? That pain went away, and it never goes away this fast, and, you know, I just wanted to tell you that, that it's a testimony. I remember the other day, I was driving with my wife, and she's like, her brace is giving her problems because she bit something, and it broke. So her, ba her brace her brace broke. Uh, I call them brace. If you guys have Russian parents or Ukrainian parents, I call them brace. Uh, whoever knows what that means. So anyway, her, her braces, she's like, she's like driving. She's annoyed because it's all poking her in her side, and it's been like that for a couple days. And uh, I'm like, well, I'm going to pray for you. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how God heals metal. And so I'm like, I'm just going to pray for you uh, because God said to come, come with him and everything and all of our little things and our big things, right? Sometimes we just come to God when we're like, God, I need to get into school. God, you know, and that's good. You can come to God for big things. As you should be coming to God for big things. But also come to God for little things. And I remember it was just, it was the funniest thing because I didn't know what was going to happen. I'm like, God, can you, because we're driving to church and um, I like to sit in peace at church. And so I'm like, God, please help this woman. I'm like, God, I don't know. And then as I'm praying for her, as I'm praying for her, we're like right here by the church. She gets this, she gets this thought of wisdom. Just, just right there. I mean, we're we're praying. I'm I'm praying for her. I don't even think she was praying. I'm praying for her because I don't, 
She was annoyed, like I said. So I'm like, Lord, help this woman. God, help her with her brace, you know, brace face. Anyway, so I'm like, God, help her braces. And uh, she gets this, she gets this, you know, this, this, you know, some people might say, oh, it's a coink dink But I don't think it's a coincidence. So she gives this thought with it. And she's like, oh, you know what? I can move this thing over and it's not going to poke. And then so she moves over the actual brace. And she hasn't been complaining since. You still need to get that fixed, by the way. So, but, but what happened was is that, is that the problem was solved. God gave her wisdom, and the problem was solved. And as, I, as, as I'm continuing in ministry, my vision is growing stronger. My vision is getting bigger. And, and as I look at our ministry and I think, God, we have such an outstanding ministry. It's irregular. Compared to the size of our church, our ministry is explosively huge. You might say, well, that's not explosively. How many people you got in here? Alex? Well, let me tell you something. The average church, a good youth ministry in the average church, or the average size youth ministry in a church is 10%. Our church has about 120 people. So that'd be about 12 people. They say an above average exceeding expectations is if all the people from the church show up to the youth. That's about 20%. Our church, our youth ministry is, far exceeds that. We have a lot more people than that in our youth ministry, and it's not because, it's not because, it's not because we're aiming at goals. I never read these statistics before until the other day um, because when you feel down, you find yourself some good statistics. If you ever feel down, like, God, what's happening in the church? So you find yourself some good statistics. I'm like, wow, you know what? God has been blessing us more than we could ever, uh, exceedingly abundantly, more than we could ever ask or think, right? So, and, and, we're, and we're, we're off the charts as far as, as, far as, um, as, far as statistics goes for a youth ministry. That's a blessing, of God. One of our visions in, in this church and one of our missions in this church, one of the things that I run with, one of the things that our re- leaders run with is to raise up more leaders, is to raise up more leaders. And as you look around and you find a leader that you know in this church, you'll know that they've committed their, themselves because they love you. They don't commit themselves because they get some kind of pay. They don't get, commit themselves because they get an attaboy because a lot of times they don't. They get a bad girl, bad boy. <laughs> If anything, sometimes when people make mistakes, people point those things out. And it's very rarely that they'll get appreciation from somebody. But I want you to know that I know I love you. I love every person in this place. That's why I'm here. I know that the leaders love you. And we invest because we desire for there to be a generation that knows God. Not a generation that goes to church, but a generation that knows God and is in love with God, a generation that can read the Bible for themselves, a generation that knows the truth and is not afraid to proclaim the truth. That is our mission. Our goal at the end of the day is that you will be independent, is that you can walk with God and you will have a vision for doing God's work. But you'll never get there if you have this failure to even launch, if you have this failure to start doing anything for God at all. I know a lot of times people hold back from doing anything for God because um, they don't want to put in the work. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry for people like that because ministry is hard work. It's not just a bunch of vision where someday, uh, someday I'm going to, whatever, do something like someday somebody's going to call me and I'm going to, I don't know what you might think, and I'm going to sing in front of a million people on national television. Someday somebody's going to call me and you're just sitting around in your house and you're like, I'm waiting for the call. What are you doing? I'm believing. What are you doing? I'm praying. What are you doing? I got this vision. My youth pastor told me to have a vision. So what are you doing? I'm praying. No. Start doing. You want to do something? Join the worship team. You might not even have a good voice. But don't worry. They'll work with you here. Glory to Jesus. They'll help you. They're going to help you develop your voice. Believe it or not, I used to sing as the first tenor in a choir. First tenor means number one. They put me as number one for all the other tenors to follow the first tenor. Yes, that is my boasting for the day. (laughs) And the only reason I could do it is because the lady would spend time with me. I think she just liked me as an individual, as a human being. She's like, you're a nice guy. We're going to make you first. I'm like, yes, first. I'm like, I don't know how to sing. She's like, that's cool. I'll teach you. Cool, great. 
You want to do something? You have a vision to lead a generation? You have a vision to be a preacher? Start preaching. You have a vision to do something? Find your impact group leader and say, hey, can I lead one sometime? You have a vision to do something for God? Find Christina. We have a conference coming up. It's kind of a big deal. It's a big deal because there's going to be people in there that don't know Christ. There's going to be people in there that have fallen away from Christ. And right now what we're doing is we're praying for this conference, for people to be transformed and changed. And we need people to greet these people. We need people to seat these people. We need people, in other words, to love these people that are coming in because they may never, ever, ever step into another church again. How are you serving God? What is your greater vision for God and how are you pursuing that? You can't have both of your hands in vision. You can't have both of your hands in a dream because then you're just daydreaming, right? If, if, you, if, you, have, if you have your mind set on a dream all the time, you're just daydreaming. But the person who has their mind on a dream and their feet pursuing something, they're working hard towards their vision, Right? Stand up together. We're going to pray. The Bible says that those who are faithful and little will be entrusted and much. Don't spend your time wandering in circles. There are greater days ahead. Our our, 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 our vision or, or my hope that every week that the next week will be even greater. I don't care how good the service was. I, I care about how many people were saved and I care about how good the service are, but my vision and my dream and my hope is that next week, you know, we're gonna learn and we're gonna be even greater. The worship team is gonna be even greater. The preachers will be even greater greater the people that are following after christ will be more passionate the the congregation will fall in love with the savior and that together we'll run this race this isn't one race where where the leaders here run and everybody else just follows no we're all running the same race after jesus christ we bow our heads close our eyes let's pray Father, I thank you, Lord, that we can come to you. The Bible says that, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, who are, who are distracted by the things of this world, who are, who are not pursuing Christ. And Jesus says, and I will give you rest. I'll give you hope, I'll give you a future, God says, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans to prosper you, not to harm you. There is a vision that God has laid in some of your hearts and in your stubbornness and in your your unwillingness, you are not pursuing what God has done. Maybe it's because of something somebody said. Maybe it's because you don't like me. I don't know why. If you don't like me, get over it. If it's because of what somebody said, don't let them hold you back. Pursue Christ to pursue Christ. We have a vision in this church. We have a future in in this ministry. There is this hope. We will train you. We will help you. We will encourage you. My job is to lift you up. Take everything that you can learn and be greater than every leader in this place. And I desire for every leader to be greater than me. My hope and my vision is that one day I'll look back and I'll say, wow, out of this ministry arose pastors and preachers and youth pastors and worship leaders and deacons and they're all over the world and they're worshiping and pursuing God and from this ministry because we love them and because they loved God. We'll help you. But you have to make the decision to follow Christ wholeheartedly. Nobody can do that for you. I cannot encourage you enough. And I'm a good encourager. Believe it or not. I can encourage you. I can tell you. I can help you. I can feed you. I can give you the spoon. But you're going to have to put that spoon in your mouth. 
you're eventually going to have to learn how to eat. You're eventually going to have to learn how to read the Bible for yourself. You're eventually going to have to learn how to pursue Christ. And if you don't, and if you can't, you are running aimlessly and you will fail in life following after Christ. Father, I just pray today, Father, that as we stand before you, my God, as we have come before you as a church, as a congregation, Lord, I pray, my God, that you will just fill up the hearts of these people, my God, of the people here. My God, I pray that you would fill them with a vision, my God. Right now, I pray, my God, that you would give them a vision of the future, my God, of what they could do for you, of the great things that they could accomplish for you. My God, of the ministries that they will lead, of the people that they will love, of the people that they will serve, of the hearts that will be transformed and changed. You know, I wanna, we're gonna have an altar call and I'm gonna invite you forward if you wanna give your heart to the Lord. Because here's the reality. If you've never given your heart to the Lord or if you've walked away from God and you can do that, you can turn your back on God. If you've walked away from God or if you haven't given your heart to the Lord, you're not even in the race. You're not even in the running. You're somewhere else running aimlessly. And today I wanna give you that opportunity that if you want to get to know Christ as your personal savior, Jesus Christ who came to this earth, died on the cross for your sins and my sins, who loved you enough to die for you. He rose again, and in him we have life. We have eternal life. If you want to commit your life or recommit your life to following Jesus, and you want to get in the race, can you just raise your hand? I want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. You're saying, I want to commit my life to following Christ. Thank you.